Hi folks, welcome to today's Public Lands Alliance webinar, Staying Engaged, Starting Up Virtual Tours Quickly. Another in our series of webinars designed for our public lands community related to COVID-19 and our collabor collaborative response in these challenging times. I'm Chuck Benjamin, I'm Education and Training Manager for the Public Lands Alliance. During the webinar, if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please type them in the chat box. You'll see that in the navigation bar down below. And we will address them at designated intervals throughout the webinar. Today's webinar is presented by Andrew Feinberg and Yeet Eater of Time Looper. Now, we are designated to go to uh, about three o'clock with this today, but something tells me that there will be some questions. Um, so the gentlemen have uh, gamely uh, volunteered to stay on till 3.30. So we will go till either 3.30 or all the questions are answered, whichever comes first. So why don't we go ahead and, uh, and get started. I have nothing else to say, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Andrew. Andrew? Thank you, Chuck. Uh, Good morning or good afternoon, everybody uh, across the country. Um, for those of you who we got to meet a couple of weeks ago, it was a pleasure to actually meet you for the first time in person uh, in the nation's capital. Uh, for those of you who we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, it is an absolute pleasure. Uh, Yeet and I are principals with a company called Time Looper. We've spent the last six years working with uh, public lands partners federal state agencies uh, and nonprofit organizations to bring digitally immersive experiences to their visitors uh, at their sites and for distance-based learning as well. The conversation that we're having today is not one that Yeet and I could have ever imagined bringing to this community uh, as recently as two weeks ago when we were in uh, Virginia, but here we are. And so with this, uh, our objective uh, for our time together today is to give all of you very simple and actionable steps that you can take to turn your institution, whether it's a public land, historic site, museum, whatever it may be, to take your institution online in digitally engaging and immersive ways. Basically, how can you keep your doors open and have impact at a time when social distancing is the norm and at a time where in many uh, instances, people are actually being requested to shelter in place. Um, and as Chuck mentioned, we have about an hour officially allotted. So to the extent that you have questions as we go, we will try to address them in the chat at that part in the presentation. But if the questions become um, too voluminous to ensure that we get through all of the content that we wanna get through within the hour, we will punt on some of those until uh, between three and 3.30. Uh, and of course, he and I are happy to take any conversations offline and answer questions you have, help you troubleshoot, et cetera. Now, before we dive into how to bring your institution online in virtual reality, uh, we really want to start uh, by level setting with a very simple uh, uh, definition around what virtual reality is, because everybody has their own definitions. And while one is not correct, it might be helpful for all of us to stop and take a step back and sort of align on that. So at the end of the day, the principal objective of virtual reality is to enable people to immerse themselves in an environment that is not their own. It's really that simple. When I am on my couch with my kids tomorrow afternoon on day 14 of our shelter in place, and they're yearning to go somewhere else, it will be my objective to take them out of our living room and away from everything that we're dealing with and to put them in a different place, whether that's at Yosemite, whether it's on the rim of the Grand Canyon, or you know, it's at uh, my local community park. The idea is to completely take them out of this environment and to put them into that other space. There are two ways in which virtual reality gets built and they are quite different. So the first is when you have an environment that looks today as the, uh, as the environment in which you want to immerse people in, you can simply take video, photo, or scans of the world as it looks and then post-produce those with very simple steps and put them in places where people can immerse themselves, whether it's on the web or on any number of platforms. There are also times when you want to immerse people in a visual environment that doesn't exist. 
For example, how often do interpreters say, imagine a place where, imagine when, imagine what the world will look like or how it did look. In those instances in which you wanna take people out of their living room or out of your public land and take them into the future or into the past, you need to, you need to utilize something called computer generated imagery or short for CGI. These technologies have come a long way since Jurassic Park came out in the 90s, but it's effectively the same thing. Recreating environments, doing so as in historically and accurate a fashion as is possible, um, but at the same time also making it entertaining and engaging. And with these technologies, it isn't enough to just visualize, right? Because if all we were doing was visualization for the sake of visualization, um, it would be a neat trick but it wouldn't actually help you to enhance your goals, to uh, further contextualization, understanding, meaning. Uh, it's not just didactic, it's highly emotive. You want people to connect with your stories because when they connect with your stories, they develop a deeper relationship with that land or your organization. And so VR, as some people have called it, is the empathy machine because it really takes people out of their environment and places them as a protagonist in the center of a story in a way in which has never been possible before. So with that, because we are gonna spend a lot of time talking about what these different virtual technologies are and how you can build them, uh, and these are such visual mediums, I'm gonna actually pass the mic off to my colleague Yeet who will walk you through a series of visualizations of different interpretive VR technologies. So that way, as we refer to them later on in the presentation, you have some understanding of what that is. So Yeet, I'm gonna now pass it to you. All right. Um, I'm joining this call via my iPad. And now from my iPad, I'm going to open my uh, Time Looper app to show you some examples. So that it's, it's you can uh, to help you to conceptualize how this technology works. Um, so the first of all, I'm going to show you an example from Washington Monument. Now I'm sharing my screen. All right. So in this example, um, Washington Monument was closed for uh, about two years ago. It was supposed to be closed for two months. And then a National Park Service asked us, okay, during this time, can you show the view from the top? Now with my iPad, I'm turning around myself in 360 degrees. And then this is the view from the top at present day. As Andrew was mentioning, so how can we add more interpretive layer to this experience? And then here's what we did. Their goal, and National Park Service goal is to show Washington DC uh, in different time periods, changing landscapes, the history of nation Washington DC. And then as you can see, now we are going to 1800s. And then you can add interpretive element like pictures, audio files to make what we are using, looking at more meaningful. And then there are many other different time periods in this experience, and this is full 360 degrees. With that, I'm passing it back to Andrew. Thank you, um, As you saw there, the present day 360 degree view was what we would call photo video scan of the real world. And then when we went back to 1800, that was an example of computer generated imagery. So for those of you sort of wrestling with CGI versus photo, the, the photorealism of a CGI environment that you may or may not want to deploy is not necessarily a limitation, not necessarily a technological limitation. Oftentimes it's a creative limitation um, or how you think about wanting to visualize that world. So I would encourage you not just to think about um, photo, video of present day as the only way to generate photorealistic uh, experiences. Um, and then the last important takeaway that I'll share from this is that um, what you noticed was that Yeet was using his iPad, right? So it's important to consider that when your users are consuming this content from their homes in this COVID environment, whether they're doing it as a family with kids or they're doing or they're consuming it on a virtual field trip because they were supposed to take the school bus to your public land in two weeks, 
um, or they're an elderly person who is being suggested to socially isolate. All of these people can consume this content without buying any hardware. If they have an Android phone, if they have an iPhone, if they have a tablet device, they have virtual reality. Even if they have a desktop computer, we're gonna show you examples, they have a virtual reality time machine. Obviously, there are trade-offs, and obviously, some of these hardware mediums are gonna be more immersive than others, but don't allow the limitation of people not having $200, $500, or $1,000 headsets at home to be the limiting factor or the justification as to why you don't open your doors and immerse people in your community. So with that, um, I wanna talk a little bit about basic VR content development and uh, publishing. Um, so we have two examples here. So as you saw for the Washington Monument, that 360 degree photo that uh, Yeet previously uh, showed, uh, it's very simple for you to take a 360 degree photo and, and take it yourself and publish it online. Same with a 360 degree video. So what you would do is you would acquire consumer grade equipment, go to Amazon and you can buy for 200, 300, $500. The most expensive camera on this list is $700. Buy a camera and you can take photos and or video from inside of your institution and then you can publish them immediately to the web. So this could all be done by dinner time today if you really want to. Um, and, and so for example, here is the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. So you could take photos by yourself, in 360 degree photos, just like they did here at the Guggenheim. And this is the Google platform that you could publish on. And you can load all of these photos directly on the, uh, onto the web yourselves, share this link with your key stakeholders, and now they can travel within your institution. And they could even, if you develop it the right way, even move physically within your institution. Seamless, very simple. Allow people to visualize what it's like to be inside of your uh, physical space. Um, now the limitation of utilizing this is that it doesn't provide a lot of uh, interactive elements. So as we were talking about before, the key to making really compelling VR is the intersection between powerful visual uh, and place-based consumption with interpretive meaning. And some of that meaning doesn't necessarily come through in a photo. So another option is to deploy a video. So YouTube hosts 360 video. So you could very simply use your Insta360 One X and go and put a tripod down, have an interpreter, a volunteer, an education specialist, capture this content and then publish it right on the web. So this is an example from, an example from Edison National Historic Park. National Historical Park. I'm glad you can join me here in Edison's library, or some refer to it as his office. He spent a lot of time here in West Orange, arrived here in 1887, spent the rest of his life till he passed away in 1931. He did a lot of work here at his desk, and as you take a look at it, you can see there's a lot of papers and a lot of books. So you can see right there how much more engaging it is to put somebody in the middle of this piece of content. So once you've created this content, you can then go ahead and publish it on any of these free plat publication platforms. Some of them are easier than other. Oh, and I should have mentioned, we're gonna pass around this document or through PLA, and there are links at the back of this presentation, so you don't necessarily need to take notes if you don't want to. And this will also be, this recording will also be made available. Um, but you can pu publish this to YouTube, you can publish it to Facebook, to Vimeo, to Oculus, and then people can consume all of this content at home. You can even embed those 360 videos right within your website. Um, so Yeet, did you wanna do uh, a couple of additional demos now? Or did you wanna wait? Okay. All right, okay. So then next, how, so the, the, that's some of how you can create simple content, but we have some thoughts on how you how you should think about it or how to make it more meaningful. So for us, the context and meaning are very different for each of our different public lands partners. And so some examples include if you are a uh, you know if you're if you're a natural space, allowing people to simply explore the park, right? Possibly meeting endangered species. Um, if you actually have 360 photos from the past that you've never done anything with, immediately making it possible to visualize alternate seasons. 
with these digital technologies, you have the ability to actually enhance access to your park, even in, non even in non COVID environments by allowing people to access um, delicate ecosystems that you typically don't allow access to. So this is a great opportunity to go capture some of that content, allow people to explore your parks in ways that they couldn't before. If you're a historic site, you know, what make these places feel special is the grandeur uh, of them and, and the moments that occurred there. So now you can allow your visitors to uh, up close in person in an intimate manner, uh, engage with historically important artifacts or see parts of your historic site that they couldn't before. Um, and then of course, if you're a museum, you've got a host of special collections or regular collections that sit behind plexiglass that you don't want people to explore. You can now allow your user to get up close and personal with all of these, uh, all of these objects. Regardless of the content journey that you wanna create, you have to consider the environment we're in. People are stuck at home, they're detached from their community and they're detached from their culture. Anything that you put out there now is gonna provide some semblance of connective tissue. However insignificant um, or unsubstant unsubstantial as it may feel, it makes a huge difference. Um, and so in thinking about how to take your existing institution and port it into VR, you know, we would really encourage you, you know, to think about the existing programming that you have on site, because that's probably your strength. So for example, if you are a natural, uh, if you're a public land and you do a lot of ninth grade biology field trips, you already have that interpretive content developed. So double down on that. Take these 360 photos, deploy that additional educational content into that environment, deploy your naturalist in a 360 in the foreground of that video and go from there. With that content, you can start very quickly. So we would really encourage you to think about what makes your place special, why do people come there, and then how you can, to, to the extent possible, port that meaning from a physical environment into the digital space. So with that, I uh, want to uh, talk about a couple of ways in which you can take a further step and add interpretation to VR. So we spent a bunch of time already talking about the power of uh, 360 video and how that's a step above uh, 360 still images. Uh, but there are steps that you can take with both of these products to actually enhance the product that you're delivering to your users without a lot of extra work, especially in the context of 360 degree picture. So as I showed you from Google Arts and Culture, you can take a look at that 360 environment, but wouldn't it be great if as you were looking at that piece of art, you could have a deeper understanding or appreciation for, um, for what you were seeing in the foreground, uh, or as you're looking at a natural environment, what it is that you see, um, or, or advancing those, uh, those, um, those interpretive uh, values. Um, or if you're looking at a 360 degree video, actually being able to show a time travel visualization uh, in real time, which will dramatically enhance the visual and emotive impact of what that experience is like. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Yeet, who's gonna show you, especially for the 360 interactive pictures, very simple and quickly developed experiences that you can develop and publish, and then also what a more, uh, interpretive uh, piece of uh, movie 360 uh, film looks like. All right, I'm sharing my screen again. So the first example is from Ford's Theater at Peterson House. Uh, again, Peterson House was closed for a period of time. And then we went inside and then we took a 360 picture of the rooms. So this is very simple. As Andrew was describing, you can do it with a very simple camera. Then very quickly, you can add interpretive content. So these are the people who were in that house on that day when, uh, when Abraham Lincoln died. And now, I inquired where Miss Lincoln was and was informed that she was in the front parlor. I entered the parlor and found her there entirely alone. She was standing by a marble top table in the center of the room, with her bonnet on and gloved, just as she came Why home did you not come to me last night, Elizabeth? I sent for you, Mrs. Lincoln asked in a low whisper. Right. So this is an indoor example. Now, um, 
And then I'm going to show you an example from outdoor swimming park, um, East Bay Regional Parks. Let's find it. Um, East Bay Regional Parks, they, um, they have been running this program for over a year now. Um, their goal is to bring parks to schools and communities who don't have access to these places. Either they don't have the means to travel or they have their, due to accessibility, they cannot come to these points. So we, um, they took these 360 pictures, just like in the previous example. And then we sent them, they, we, we shared our platform and they highlighted what they wanted to show in this experience. Pleasanton Ridge Regional Park's open space protects land that is vital for the plants and animals who make a home on these hillsides. Bountiful wildflowers. Can As urban areas around regional parks expand, plants and animals seek out new habitats. Urban oak trees and local... As you can see, you can use pictures, tags, audio, graphics, and then cover different topics around this area. So this is very easy, very quick way of um, bringing your parks institutions to the homes and classrooms. Now, the next example is a little bit more complicated. It's a VR movie. That movie is from Federal Hall in downtown New York. where George Washington was integrated. So let's look at this experience now. It has been such an exciting spring. Our new nation's first electoral college has selected Revolutionary War General George Washington to be its first president. Rumor and notice of our war hero's pending arrival to New York City, now our nation's capital, has created a sense of festivity. He traveled from his... And then I go back to Andrew. Thank you, Yeet. Um, and so... You know, the examples that we showed you there, you know, happen to be ones uh, that we have produced. But, you know, I do also want to continue to really hammer home that you can do some of this. So my favorite platform for building this by yourself is what we call Pano 2 VR. It's a really great tool that if you feel like you're up to the task and you want to roll up your sleeves because you're stuck at home, you can also, you know, sort of do it yourself with this kind of platform. Uh, there's also, you know, another one that we've used, which is Virtual Tour Creator. Virtual tour creator was initially developed, you know, more for the real estate space. Um, but, you know, in these times, you sort of use what you can get your hands on. So uh, it really just depends upon how much of a DIY uh, uh, attitude you have on these, on these sorts of things. But as I mentioned before, regardless of the type of interpretive technology that you want to deploy, you should also think about the content that you want to deploy. So, for example, if you are going to do a 360 degree uh, series of photos and you know that you have a school group, that comes every day in the month of April and May because it's your busy season, and now you've just lost you know, 25,000 students who are now stuck at home, you can take that content and embed it into a virtual environment. Um, and doing this does a couple of things. A, it helps you get to market as quickly as possible because you don't need to start from the question of what is it that we're trying to tell people? What is it that we're trying to teach them? Um, and then beyond that, it allows you to build it really quickly and then market it to those groups. So you can email all of your points of contact at these schools that you have previously coordinated with who are responsible for getting their students to your institution and say, hey, look, your students might be stuck at home, but you can utilize this. And because it's on Facebook 360, because it's on YouTube 360, because it's on the Time Looper app, which you only need to download onto your smart device or your tablet, which everybody has at home for distance-based learning anyway, all of your students can actually undertake this field trip in the course of our day at home and help get people off the couch and break up that monotony. So we would, again, I'm just trying to really hammer home that for this content to have enhanced meaning, really play to your strengths. Um, 
and what we've also been spending a little bit of time talking about today is individual pieces of content, but there are also ways in which you can connect those pieces of content together. So for those of you that are public lands in particular or historic sites, the, 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 the physical relativity of these different connected points is highly meaningful because the geography tells part of that story. If you're standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon, being able to look over and look into the canyon and, the, and to get a sense of the scale of that and to be able to move across the rim is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Or to, you know, to be able to walk across the Appalachian Trail all the way from Georgia to Maine in five minutes is an incredibly powerful tool that enhances the interpretive takeaway that these people have when they're consuming these products or these interpretive experiences. So you could actually utilize a map as a platform and then embed these different pieces of content on that map so that people can move through these digital environments with that sense of relative scale and, uh, and physical relationship. Now, it, people, you, you can make it so people don't even have to walk if you have safety concerns or accessibility concerns. You can do you know, drag uh, mechanisms and other locomotion tools but there is a lot of power in allowing people to use a tablet device to walk through their living room, start in California, you know, and end in Nevada. Um, and so with that, I'm actually gonna ask Yeet to show uh, an example as well uh, of, what, uh, of what this product might look like. You're on mute. Is my iPhone. Now I'm going to show you, share my screen, but I would like you also to see as I am walking, I'm moving inside this space and I'm holding my phone and walking around. So let me share my screen so that you have a better view. So this project was created uh, with, for Japan Tourism Association Forestry called Shimonoseki. They want to tell the story of their city. So uh, we created this experience so that people, visitors from anywhere around the world can walk and then explore different neighborhoods. So I'm going to show you how it works. Shimonoseki is a city with many stories to tell to her visitors. In some such stories, Shimonoseki played a supporting role. In others, she was the main actor, changing the course of history for the entirety of Japan. To hear her stories and witness her history unfold, start exploring by walking on the virtual map. Town might be most famous for its gardens. Thank you. So one question um, that we did get uh, from a lot of you who did fill out the survey in advance was around um, actually engaging with, uh, with student groups and facilitating uh, real-time uh, education. And so when you develop a platform like the map or you even just take a 360 photo environment, you also have the ability to facilitate video, uh, what we would call VR conferencing. You can, as an educator in the safety of your own home, uh, allow people to convene at your park. And those people can be students who are all at home in their 30 different locations around your region, and they can all use their tablet, they can use their smartphone, they can download an app onto their desktop, for example, if it's a Mac, and then they can meet you inside of that virtual environment. You, as the uh, interpretive guy, which is represented here as, in the form of a uh, very friendly and legless avatar, can actually walk you through these virtual environments and give you a tour and provide the context and challenge you as if you were there on that field trip. Now, these products are absolutely fantastic for school groups. Uh, they're great for family outings. A lot of, we've seen a lot of Facebook Live, but what this does is this takes Facebook Live to the next level. 
So now everybody can actually be inside of that environment and walk through it themselves rather than having it be a, a, a standard 2D video um, or you know, a standard video chat like we're doing on Zoom. So we, I also got a question about, you know, is Zoom the right platform? Zoom is great. And I would encourage if you find this to be a compelling format to deploy Zoom um, and you can have up to 10,000 people watching a session at once. But what Zoom doesn't provide that, you know, a VR platform for social gatherings does provide is that complete sense of immersiveness and that ability to move X, Y, and Z throughout that physical environment. However, you define it, whether it's the deck of the USS Arizona, the rim of the Grand Canyon, the Appalachian Trail, whatever it may be. Products that you can use for this include Time Looper, but you can also use a, a platform called Engage VR. So, Engage VR, and again, all of those links are at the back of this presentation. Engage VR is uh, one of the other products out there that we've seen that we like. Um, you do still have to create your VR environment and load it into Engage VR if you feel comfortable doing that but that is a relatively effective off-the-shelf solution if you feel so brave. Um, so we spent a bunch of time today talking about different kinds of uh, interpretive media. And in this environment, the question is, okay, we need to move quickly. How do we get online? How do we be responsive? How do we iterate quickly and fail quickly and then improve? And the answer is that some of these pieces of content are more suitable for moving quickly than others. Um, we believe that the biggest bang for your buck uh, and I don't mean in terms of financial cost, I mean in terms of speed to market, would be 360 degree video, uh, like we saw with Edison, and then those 360 degree interactive pictures uh, that you saw both uh, indoor at Ford's Theater and outdoor with the East Bay Regional Park District. Those products there can be developed and uploaded within a day or within 48 hours if you're talking about the 360 degree interactive pictures. Um, and they both port incredibly well across all modes of hardware. And then additionally, if you are willing to, you know, stretch things out a few days to a week, maybe 10 days, also deploying VR conferencing, getting on the horn with your school groups or with those families and with those special weekend program groups and saying, hey, would you be interested in meeting at our park, at our fort? but doing so digitally, and our ranger will still take your students through that two hour lesson that we were gonna previously do. Now I will say the downside of the VR conferencing is that it's not scalable. So whereas with the interactive map, the 360 degree picture and the 360 degree video, it's an on-demand solution, VR conferencing you really wanna limit to smaller groups. That being said, you can record those sessions, just like we're recording this one, and post them online to give some additional uh, level of scalability to the effort that you're putting into your VR conferencing. But if what you are valuing the most is, I mean, there's a trade-off, right? So the intimacy you get from VR conferencing is just gonna be a little bit less scalable. But everything in that COVID-19 sweet spot that we have sort of highlighted here, um, you could get online certainly within a couple of weeks if your resources allowed for it. Um, and I mean time and effort. Um, and it's not expensive to do. Um, and so the last thing that I will mention is once you build this, you can't just expect that everybody's going to, you know, trample down your doors. Um, this isn't field of dreams, right? So if you build it, they will come doesn't really work. You need to think about how you're going to push this out to your community. So what you see on the left is, you know, like a website. Uh, notification where when people come to your web, they see a pop-up notification that says, hey, we're closed due to state regulations um, or due to the discretion of our board, go to these resources or use social media. More importantly, also do outreach to those existing stakeholder groups that I mentioned, those groups that you know that we're already going to be visiting you, your donors, your members who pay an annual fee to continue to engage with you, um, they support you, not just because they come a lot, but because uh, the program means a lot to them. And so if you're able to sort of reach out to them and allow them to stay connected with your institution digitally, not only is it going to mean a lot to them, but it's going to drive a lot of engagement and enhance word of mouth to make your programs even more effective. So with that, I definitely uh, want to be mindful of time and, and, and wrap up. So I just want to share a couple of best practices with you. So first off, Find a partner who's committed to keeping their platform updated, right? There's a lot going on right now. Some smaller shops um, um, or some shops that we're not aware of might be great for developing tools, 
But then when people go to download it onto their Google phone or download it onto their iPhone or there's a software update, um, things stop working. Um, the National Mall uh, with the National Park Service developed an app a couple of years ago, and then it didn't occur to them that they would have to update it every time Apple put out an update. So those are the kinds of things that you should be thinking about. Also, don't try to boil the ocean. Start with enough to be materially substan substantive with whatever that intellectual journey is that you are defining and then get it out quickly and then iterate from there. We believe that three to five experiences, about four to seven minutes inside of a headset, a high-end headset or on a tablet device is about the length of time that you might wanna target for a comprehensive experience beyond that people could experience fatigue or kids can't pay attention for longer than five minutes doing anything anyway, much to my chagrin. So you could also think about developing serial programming. So this week we're gonna get out these three experiences leveraging you know, this interpretive program. Next week we're gonna get out the one after. Next week we're gonna get out the one after. We had a conversation with a PLA friend on Friday who actually said, this is the best time to develop this VR content because our Rangers have nothing to do because they're stuck at home. So you can take their you know, collective energy and drive it towards translating the programming that they already do so well into these um, alternative formats. Um, also, um, I just wanna remind you that it's okay to fail, right? There's a lot of understanding going on right now in the community. Try something, put it out with your community, see if they like it. What they don't like, use as feedback to iterate on the next version. It really is the best time to be beta testing. We're seeing lots of great ideas and people stepping out of their comfort zone. And really now is the time to do it. Um, and so the last thing that I'll share with you uh, is that Time Looper is supporting all of our partners also now in this time of crisis. So all of our core products around content development, content deployment using our apps, our, mock our walkable maps, our VR conferencing functionality, we're offering all of that completely free. I mean, F-R-E-E -E with no strings attached for the duration of the crisis. So if you feel like you want to go at it alone, great, good luck. We're also here to try to answer questions for you. If you can't get that 360 to upload into Facebook, we've all been there and we're happy to help solve those problems for you. But if you want somebody to hold your hand, if you want a more curated experience, if you know this is something you want to do, but you're just a little bit unsure about doing it yourself, you know, just click on this form on the link that we're sending out or visit our website on the COVID-19 link at the top and we're happy to help you. But again, there are a lot of great resources out there. A lot of these publishing platforms are free. Um, you, know, heart, you know, cameras start from $250 uh, or even lower. And, uh, and so now is definitely the time uh, to be trying this on your own. So with that, that's all of the prepared material that we have. We made it through a little bit sooner because there were surprisingly no questions. Maybe Chuck scared everyone away. But if uh, anybody has questions, you could either type them into the chat box or raise your uh, hand. You're welcome, Heidi. It was a pleasure. Um, thank you, Heidi. So if anybody has a question, uh, feel free to raise your hand or... There we go. Love all of this. Headsets seem like a barrier to access. Yes and no. Hair, headsets can be a barrier to access. But again, headsets are... Are, are, are definitionally one type of immersion, right? So when you're using a map platform, like the one that we were talking about at the end, um, or social VR, we actually find that using a tablet is better because you do get headset fatigue. Um, and we believe that you should not let the fact that people don't have headsets be the reason anyway why you don't do this. Even allowing people to consume it, Mary, just by using a, um, an iPhone or an Android phone or a tablet that they already have at home is good enough. And then if you want, you, know, you can also highlight for people that they can buy an incredibly good high-end headset for $149 for Oculus, or go on to Amazon right now and for $10 buy Google Cardboard, which are all over the internet. Um, yeah. So if you really, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, can I ask that? So um, also, as a, like a best practice, if you work with a service provider, if that service provider's platform is compatible with all these devices, then you don't have to make a choice. That's right. So for example, Time Looper works on a smartphone, Time Looper works with the headsets, and Time Looper video conferencing works on a desktop. So that way, whoever, what type of evident equipment they have, they can still consume it. Immersiveness will change, obviously. The headset is the most immersive but still they, have, they will have access to it. 
Okay, we have um, a question through the quiet of the Q and A portal from Rachel. Rachel, first time caller, long time listener, I hope. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Your question was, do you have instructional videos to help less tech savvy staff, remote rangers capture what is needed for 360? So the answer to that is no, because we're not trying to replicate the wisdom of the crowd. So um, on this series of links, you'll see lots of links that we provide. Um, and for both the content development platforms and the hardware providers, there are tons of resources on how to uh, mechanically take those photos. If you would like tips from us on how we think about content development, we're more than happy to hop on the phone and have a conversation with you. Um, um, but generally speaking, uh, the technical part, you know, there, there's a ton of information out there on the internet. Um, okay, next question here. Is there a way to use still photos to develop something immersive? The park that we partner with is completely inaccessible right now. So even with the 360 camera, we wouldn't be able to take photos. So I have thoughts on this, but I suspect he does as well because he's nodding vigorously. Yeet, do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you don't have any 360 footage, one good way of using um, your still photographs would be maybe using the map platform. So on that map, we can build the map. That's super easy. We take it from Google Maps, more modified. We have the, um, also the topography. And then we can point those pictures to different locations. So you can walk around and then see the, the park, that section, that the view from, from a 2D video. So in that case, I don't know if you remember when I was walking and uh, it, an object appeared to me instead of that tree or um, uh, the word, we can also appear it to the picture video. So the other thing that I'll do is I will now share my screen. So Rachel, because you are such a persistent partner, I'm going to use your use case. So Rachel just said to everybody in the group that we met her at PLA with Paul. Um, so I, I didn't pull up uh, Dina, but I did pull up uh, Kenai Fjords National Park. So this is Kenai Fjords National Park, and this is a 360 degree photo that I just found from Google Earth. I mean, from Google Maps. And this was produced by a gentleman named Chris York. And you can track him down without any difficulty, but I'm not going to expose him here. You, what we have found is that our partners reaching out to these individuals who take these photos, asking them for permission to use their imagery is a great way to get access to 360 photos from locations that are inaccessible today. That's not going to work for everybody in all use cases, but if you do really want 360 photos or go out on social, right? Everybody now goes out into the parks in the summer uh, with their 360, with their GoPro, reach out to your community on social and say, hey, we're trying to create 360 immersive experiences. Who's got footage that we could use, you know, free of charge? And I guarantee you'll get lots of great volunteer footage. Yeah, and there are Facebook groups like 360 yeah. enthusiasts. You can also post that and then maybe some of them have taken pictures before. Yep. Okay, next question from uh, IRKPA. Awesome. How would I get started? Um, not sure what you mean by that. Um, I mean, there are a couple of different ways. So like, if you want to get started generally, I think really the number one thing to do is to sit down with your interpreters and say, what is it that we want to show? What is it that we want people to visualize. Uh, oh, they're referring to Yeet's suggestion on how to use the Google map and still imagery. Yeet, how do they get started? So um, we will build the map so you don't have to do anything. But of course, we will send you for approval. And then what we will do is we are going to ask you and then you are going to select, you're going to say that I have these pictures. Let's say you have, you select the 10 pictures and then those 10 pictures are from different locations on the park. And you're going to, on a regular Google map, even we, you can mark them. So when you walk here, um, can you show the map, that, that example, that picture, um, a little bit scroll up? Yeah, so on the map, you're going to mark them, even if it can be a 2D map, and then we're gonna integrate them on our platform and then send it to you for approval. So the first step would be completing the form so that we'll get back to you, set up a call, and then um, to tell you the specific next steps, but as Andrew was saying, what are those pictures that you want to show? What do you want to tell about those pictures? And then the rest is we sending them to us and we'll integrate and then send you for approval. 
and then publish on the App Store. Any other questions or any, yeah, any other questions about topics that we discussed today or things that we didn't discuss today? Do you need a special 360 degree camera? Great question from Felicia. The answer to that is no, you don't need a special 360 degree camera. More important than the type of camera you're using, generally speaking, is the time of day in which you are taking these photos. So you want to avoid taking uh, photos at high noon. Uh, the best time to do it is to take photos uh, early, um, you know, early, you know, mid morning or later in the afternoon. There are also apps you can use uh, or the web to find something called golden hour um, at your site. Golden hour is a great time where the, where there are minimal shadows on the environment. Uh, this is a great question. Um, and, uh, and so those generally are, 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 the, are the, the times that I would try to do it. Okay, next question. Thanks for the presentation. How much do your services cost after COVID is over? So first off, we're gonna say, we don't know how long COVID is gonna go on and we're committed to working with our partners, however long that is, at least through the summer. Um, so it's very important that you know that if you're gonna invest the time to do this now, if the president declares that COVID is over by Easter and everybody magically gets better, that we're not gonna come back and hunt you guys down. So you guys will have plenty of time to work with this and hopefully deploy it as long as it's necessary uh, in the short term. Afterwards, uh, you know, pricing basically starts from uh, a couple hundred dollars a month for all of the services that we're offering here. Uh, and you get around um, any sort of content development costs that might come later on. Uh, if you do want access to the full pricing sheet, uh, what I would encourage you to do is to go to uh, timelooper.com slash museum uh, and hit that COVID link at the top, COVID-19, and then scroll down and you'll have the, the full standard rate sheet that you can download um, and, and take a look at that. The answer, the reason why I can't give you a specific price is because it really depends upon what it is that you're building. So some people are gonna be very ambitious from the beginning, some people are gonna start small, and so those things have an impact. Other questions? Okay, well, we're happy to stick around. We're gonna stick around until the number of participants goes from 54 down to zero. Um, and then we're gonna get Chuck uh, and Amy, um, all of these resources, including this video, and hopefully they'll get them loaded up. Uh, if Chuck and Amy allow, we'll also post them on our website, although we haven't discussed that. Um, and otherwise, please feel free to reach out with any questions. I bought my Insta360, it's not working. I do not understand YouTube 360. We're here to help. There's a lot going on. Your communities are starving for things to do, for content, for intellectual stimulation. We know it's a difficult time. We wanna help you get through it. Um, so with that, we will, uh, oh wait, hold on. Um, please remind me where the form is that you mentioned. So it's at the bottom of that COVID-19 page. If you go to the bottom of COVID-19, there's a button that says, Start Time Looper Foundations. Ah, have you seen any good examples that are specifically geared towards donors? Jessica, can you please clarify what you mean when you say good example? Oh, actually, now I understand. Um, do you mean content that is being developed for the purpose of going through development and trying to raise additional capital? Is that what you mean, Les Jessica? Yes, okay. So the answer is yes, it is still in development. But the answer to that, Jessica, is uh, Georgetown. So the Georgetown Canal, um, which is um, operated by uh, the National Park Service and Georgetown Heritage, which is a relatively new um, uh, friends organization. Um, they are working together to reconstruct the entire canal, uh, the entire portion of the CNO Canal that goes through downtown Georgetown and Washington, DC. Uh, Georgetown Heritage is raising capital um, from donors to help supplement the capital that has been uh, provided to the National Park Service and the Department of Interior through appropriations from uh, Congress. And so what they're doing is they're developing a visualization of what they want this uh, complete customer experience to look like in 2022. So that I think they've already spent like a million dollars on the boat. You know, MPS already has tens of millions of dollars to reconstruct part of the canal, but they have additional plans for what it is that they want to develop. So they're creating this visualization that their donors and their visitors can consume 
that will allow them to walk across the length of the CNO Canal, interpret key moments from you know early to mid 19th century American commerce in Georgetown, uncover untold stories such uh, that are often lost or not prominently told, such as those of uh, of, of uh, enslaved people who lived in the community. Um, and then their donors can get expire, uh, inspired and identify the buildings or the structures that they're going to want to put their name on. Okay, uh, here's uh, another question. Okay, show the problem and visualize the solution through your images and narrative. It's good, Tara. Um, that's right. Is there a question there? Show the problem and visualize the solution through your images and your narrative. Okay. Um, so with that, we will stay on. Uh, we're now down to 46. Um, Tara, that's exactly right. Uh, it's a great way to think about it. Um, and so for any of you who want to stay on, Yeet and I are happy to stay on. Uh, Chuck, you're on mute. Otherwise, I'm going to hand it back to you, Chuck. Uh, am I on mute? Can you hear no, me? No, you're not. Yes, I thought I, I actually, I just wanted to kind of make an appearance and, and thank everybody out there for joining us. Um, I think somebody commented a minute ago that was it was fantastic. It's almost like you don't know what you don't know. And this is opening up a whole wide world to a lot of folks, including me. I mean, yesterday when we went through the rehearsal, it was just amazing to me uh, what can and can't be done. But mostly I wanna thank you two for taking your time to, to help our members out, to help the public lands community out. Um, it's fantastic. The, ge the generosity of you two and, and Time Looper in general um, is incredible. Um, I don't know if you if, if we necessarily need to stay on. I think they know where to find you. Um, but as as uh, Andrew was saying, we have um, recorded this session. We will be posting it in our resource library too uh, soon, along with that um, resource sheet that you have at the end of the webinar. Uh, folks, we have done a lot of these so far. We're going to continue doing them as long as uh, the COVID situation keeps uh, keeps on. So um we're going to be getting the word out a variety of different ways so please keep your eyes and ears peeled um uh we're here for you we want to try to we're all in this together as andrew and Yeet uh, kind of uh, have demonstrated by this so um if you have any ideas for things you might like us to try to uh produce please let me know um but in the meantime uh i hope all of you will take advantage of this offer it's fantastic um and you know keep your eyes and ears peeled for for upcoming things chuck, uh so thank you chuck there's one last question people oh, okay. want to know when the video is going to be posted on your website probably tomorrow wish i think it depends i don't know what janine has actually janine will be the one posting it um i don't know what she has on her her plate for today and tomorrow but she typically will get it up the next day um so but we'll send out an email to that effect uh that it's that it's available. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you very much, um, Andrew Yeet. We're we're you're you're welcome to to turn this off and and say goodbye to everybody. Great. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, folks.